Would you like to support Cubs Out Loud? One way is to join us over on Patreon. For as little as a buck a month, patrons get early access to our shows, the pre and post show, and various other rewards. You can learn more at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud. Thanks to all of our patrons for their support in making this podcast. It's July 10th, 2022. I'm Jeff. Who's your bear? That's right. I am your bear. I'm Damon. I don't brew the tea. I just serve it. And that makes me Gary. Everyone else is thinking it, and I just say it. And welcome to Cubs I Lot, the Bear Podcast of Indeterminate Length, episode number 655. And uh, this uh, ends up being that's uh, something which kind of, sort of, although we're not labeling it, it is one of these. Breaking news in the land of health. <laughs> we move to the man who is familiar with the matter. He oh, God. Is familiar. So F W T M. FWTM, Gary. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about this intro. <laughs> All improvised. You got to be impressed by that. <laughs> Improv. <laughs> Anyways. Um, yeah, so I'll start off with this. Um, if you saw the title of the show, you have an idea, baby-ish, what we're going to be talking about today. But... Um, since I came into my job that I have currently, what are you, David? What are I you was doing? Doing the alert, alert, oh. alert, oh. alert. <laughs> I thought you were like lip syncing me. I was very confused. Anyways, <laughs> um, <laughs> the since I came into this particular job, I have consciously made an effort to not turn my job into a part of what we do here at the podcast but. however that said i really feel that today's topic is an amenable like portion to that because um it is we just wrapped up pride season i think currently it's bear week or about to be bear week in p-town and yeah. there are some events coming up this year some sizable events um, and, you know, people are, are traveling, they're, they're doing things and they're, we're very much uh, going back to our behaviors pre pandemic. Um, and that can have some consequences um, if you're not aware of some things that are going on. So today's like episode is meant to be kind of a, like it's titled, it's a health alert, but it's about beyond STIs because um, sexually active people um, hopefully are aware or educated that they could become infected with commonly known diseases. Um, those are typically chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Um, there are some others. Um, but that's kind of the biggies that most people are aware of. And if they are on PrEP, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, they most likely are getting tested regularly every 90 days, maybe every six months. Um, for those STIs in addition to HIV while they're on their PrEP regimen. Yes. This is beyond that, hence the title of, of this particular podcast. Um, for those that are not aware, uh, in 2022, there are two other diseases that have been reported for outbreaks with cases and cases rising um, in some areas among the category uh, that's always referenced to as MSM or men who have sex with men. Um, it is the clinical designation that is given for tracking purposes of what we call cases, reports, or investigations. Okay. Um, so I wanted to bring awareness to these two other diseases um, as an educational opportunity to our audience, uh, to everyone, so that they know kind of what these things are in case you hear about them, or you might see some things 
in social media, in the news, online, and you're, you know, or someone might say something, like, kind of as a passing reference. Um, and understandably, people may not be really educated, and there's no judgment in that. Um, I know what I know because of my job. If mm -hmm. I didn't have my job, I probably also wouldn't necessarily know all that much. Um, I'm also a person who likes to try to read up on things, so I might have taken the the notion of doing some some research. So this particular episode, we have a lot of links that are going to be put into the blog as reference um, for my co-hosts who are just seeing like the the long <laughs> amount of information that's in here. I'm going to go over most of it. Um, but I'm going to probably be more like highlighting and kind of referencing as we go along. But if anyone's interested in some of the things that are discussed, there's going to be a lot of like clickable web resources that you can kind of go through to, to learn more about. Um, because I think it's important that people have the information available to them. Um, and then when we get to the bottom, I'll kind of go recap and some takeaways, uh, and, stuff to be aware of. You know, the court sort of verbiage, the warning, the alert of, you know, we are not medical professionals, we are not, right. um, uh, I mean, while Gary has a job in this field, in a sense, um, he is, you're more of an advocate, could I use that word? Uh, yeah, like I, I work in HIV prevention specifically, which is yeah. um, tangent or parallel to STI prevention, so I have a lot of information that comes my way via work about disease, mm -hmm. Um, outbreaks, different things of, of that nature. And yeah. part of HIP pre prevention is about knowing the landscape of the, uh, the communities that will be affected. Um, and there is a philosophy, a, a, a consideration that individuals who have repeated exposures to um, sexually transmitted infections are more likely to contract HIV. Hence, mm -hmm. knowing about things that are going on in communities that could potentially lead to HIV um, exposure is a piece of like the job that I do. But you are accurate, Damon, to say like as a as kind of a liability legal reference, like we are not medical providers. We do not, you know, have any jurisdiction. All of this information that I'm going to be going over today and discussing and trying to answer is based off of the resources that we're linking to. Hence, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that folks can yeah. look over um, to check out. And uh, I think a lot of this folks may not necessarily know. So to get us started, the CDC, um, the Centers for Disease um, uh, in Atlanta, here in the U.S., and, and I apologize to everybody. Most of this is going to be CDC based. There are some uh, World Health Organization links later on. Uh, but the CDC actually, and I didn't even know this, even with my job until researching for today's show, has an MSM um, like kind of carve out within their website of different information. Um, they have a health page. They have a general information page. They have an STD info page. And all of these links are going to be included. But I thought it was pretty cool that they recognize that this is a population that they want to get messaging out towards. So they do campaigning and things. And a lot of this is an outgrowth from the AIDS epidemic and the lessons learned from the 80s and the 90s where HIV, when it was originally um, discovered and focused on at a smaller scale and then eventually larger and larger scales, it was communicated and treated as if it was a gay men's like mm -hmm. issue or problem. Um, there was also a lot of moral like aspects to it at the time that, you know, that our behaviors, quote unquote, as gay and uh, quote unquote, you know, bisexual men were bringing about, you know, our own health demise, quote unquote. Mm. And then when HIV was being transmitted into, as some people say, the broader population, and they realized that it's not just – MSM, you know, who could be infected with HIV. Uh, and it took, you know, courageous people coming forward, celebrities. Um, Ryan Weick was a child who had, you know, contracted due to a, a transfusion. Um, hence, we have the Ryan White Act and Ryan White funding in HIV. It took like a lot of that stuff to kind of change it. So right. now the CDC, I think, is, is deliberately um, aware of like the pain that they caused and trying to address that in a much like healthier proactive way mm -hmm. um, that being said though it is difficult and i'll kind of get into that with these two particular um infectious disease outbreak things when these cases started appearing in the msm communities in different places 
it becomes a little awkward because to the lay public, it looks like some might have this opinion. I've not heard it, but I can imagine someone might be like, oh, there go the gays again, you know, <sighs> partying, having fun, not giving a shit, you know, getting mm. infected with stuff, spreading things around. And that's that's not a fair estimation or opinion because right. there's some important things to know about um, the the LGBTQIA like community as a broad grouping is usually much more aware of their own health for multitudes of factors um, particular like I was talking about earlier with prep MSM are usually f much more engaged in their personal health care because they are regularly getting tested um, for different infectious diseases, conditions, and then taking care of those things um, compared to uh, statistically the lay public. Some people uh, now, most insurance, especially if you have something through the marketplace with the Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, you have to have at least one fiscal year. So, and the whole reason behind that is to get people more engaged and have an awareness of what their, their health is because I'm just going to say it. We have a broken like healthcare system, like right. industry in the U.S. Um, right, and so people kind of avoid it because it costs money. Right. So that being said, um, because we're in more engaged as a community in our own healthcare, it's actually it makes a lot more sense that we would be the first line of awareness about things that are going on that the lay public may not know. Um, and they might dismiss symptoms as other things, not knowing that they actually have an infection of, of a different disease of some kind. So that being said, um, the first one is the shorter of the two subjects to go over. Um, meningococcal disease. There's an outbreak that uh, came about this year in Florida. Uh -huh. So to give people some background, um, meningococcal uh, I forget what the actual clinical name is. Um, meningococcal meningitis uh, comes from a bacterium, and aka a bacteria. Um, there's going to be a couple links to the CDC and what um, MSM or men who have sex with men need to know. They made a nice uh, PDF kind of giving a breakdown of stuff. It's actually on my door at uh, my office at work in case people are passing by and they're really bored and they want to read something. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, they get bored at health. Anyways. Um, but you're going to see some references uh, to two of these points that I wanted to give some background on. So there's a thing called zero groups. Um, and just as a quick kind of definition, a zero group is a is a group of bacteria that has a common antigen. It's very scientific, very clinical. The point is, is that there are 13 zero groups of meningococci or bacteria that have been described in existence. Why is that important? Well, there are two particular groups of this bacteria known as B or C, and those have caused the majority of the meningococcal meningitis cases in the United States since World War II. Before that, it used to be group A. It's kind of like how we talk about COVID and variants. And mm -hmm. so like we got Delta, now we got Omicron, and you know, we've got like the new BA4 or the BA5. It's all right. kind of the same concept um, for titling. So more than 99% of the meningococcal infections have been caused by these zero groups, quote unquote, um, known as A, B, C, 29E, or W-135. The only wow. reason why that's important to know that there are these strong versions of the bacteria is because this zero group C outbreak in Florida here in the U.S., um, the CDC is encouraging that gay bisexual men or other men who have sex with men with or without HIV doesn't matter. Um, that there you get vaccinated. Um, there's what's called the men ACWY vaccine mm -hmm. that's recommended for people if they live in Florida, um, no matter where you live in the state. Uh, and it's recommended that you talk to your health care provider about getting this vaccine if you are going to be traveling to Florida. Right. So to kind of caveat, as Gary mentioned, um, there's a big event coming in Florida in September. Mm -hmm. um, Roll Bear Weekend is in um, Florida this year. It's been moving around every year, and this year it's now going to be in Florida. Um, fortunately, again, Adam and the team are on it. They sent notices on the Facebook page and the um, Telegram groups just advising and asking people. They sent links to articles to kind of explain why. 
And because of that, um, I went to my local Walgreens up the street and got, a, um, I think I'm pretty sure I got the M, the men ACWY um, vaccine. Mm -hmm. And to caveat, it was rather funny because I walked up to the counter. Mm -hmm. Now, first, I like a few weeks ago, I went into Walgreens to get uh, a booster for um, COVID. Mm -hmm. And on when you go in and you're on their site, they'll say, like, do you want any other ones? And I had just seen the stuff about the meningitis. I was like, well, if it's available. And I saw that it was listed on there. I was like, let me just see if they have it. Right. I didn't get it then. And I assumed, oh, they didn't have any. I didn't hear anything. Well, so I walked in this time, like a couple of weeks ago, and walked in and just asked, like, do you have the meningitis, you know, vaccine available? And he go the pharmacist behind the counter was like, well, why? And I go, oh, well, I'm, you know, traveling soon and I want to get, you know, the vaccine. Um, and he advised after he had given me the shot, like, a lot of times people don't just come up and ask for those. Mm. Um, while it is available, mind you, he just kind of indicated that they're not always um, just something someone comes up, like, on a, on a Sunday and walks up to the counter and like, can right. I get the meningitis vaccine, please? <laughs> like, they, like, you don't think of that. Right. Um, but they had it available. Um, and I'm assuming because of my insurance, it was free. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. I don't know if it was because of my insurance or not, but it was no cost for me up front. I don't think I'm going to be charging anything, although since it was Walgreens, they probably would have charged me before. Um, so yeah, it's just rather, um, I, I'm happy I was, I got it done. Cause I know, I knew I'm going to Florida soon and, um, the world bear weekend was very communicative, communicable, communicated, communicating in regards to knowing that this was a possibility. And even though it's a few months away at the time when they were announcing it, they still wanted to make sure people were aware. Right. And and I, I think that's a, a good thing that they're being proactive and they're putting that information out there. Um, I think they probably should uh, consider doing some additional steps of that communication because not everyone's on Facebook um, or a part of the, the group, so to speak. Um, and it's not possible to reach everybody yeah. other than to send an email to everyone that's registered, which and would probably be. Did. I don't know if they one did. Of the steps. Oh. I don't know if they did or not. I may, I may I check here in a so, second. I didn't get an email. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, so <laughs> um, now, uh, in addition to that, the CDC also routinely uh, routinely recommends that the men B B as in boy vaccine is given for people ten years or older who are at increased risk of meningococcal disease um, during an outbreak involving the sero group B. Remember, the sero groups are the different kind of types of the bacteria. Um, CDC also recommends a booster shot for those at increased risk due to an outbreak who received the vaccine more than a year ago. So in particular, if you're a person who is sexually active and you travel, my right. feeling on it is talk to your healthcare provider, get the vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, if you've had them recently, you know, have it double checked. Most uh, situations you can have what's called a titer run where they check your blood to see what your immune uh, kind of levels are in terms of like the different things. But that's not always um, easily feasible. But as Damon's point was well taken, also make sure that you check most insurance plans will cover vaccination as a preventable service um, because it saves them money later in case you end up uh, having a medical condition that comes out of that. So right. there's. Uh, that um, I'm not going to get into all the details on meningitis other than uh, it can be pretty debilitating. Um, and yes, it can be deadly. Um, so it's typically, I believe, one of the things that you get vaccinated for um, when you uh, are younger. But as you age, this is the thing I'm learning about it. I'm not necessarily pleased about is that as you age, I think as a country, we're not doing very well in making sure the public's aware that you should get your stuff updated. Yeah. Uh, I think we have a, a misnomer, like kind of concept, like, oh, I got my shot when I was like two and I'm good till I'm a hundred. And it's like, well, well. <laughs> not yeah. Um, yeah. Like, so just as a perfect example of that to kind of caveat a little bit, tetanus, um, 
you should tend to get a tetanus shot or booster every, I think, 10 years. Um, but I, I, I remember one of the last times I was in the hospital um, and they asked me about it. And I'm like, I don't remember. Like, I'm being blunt. I didn't remember. And I, feel, I felt like I had had it before. You know, I know I had one before, mm-hmm. uh, but I couldn't tell you when. And finally, I they just said, "Here, we'll just you know, we'll just give you one." Because I mean, it's you know, again, like you said, it's preventable. It's a, it's to prevent the disease from happening. So most of the time, since I have insurance, it's free. So, although with the hospital, it wasn't. But that's another story. Um, but uh, again, uh, you know, this is. As you said, it doesn't happen. Like we don't get that knowledge all the time, especially as adults. You maybe hear things every now and then as you're like watching TV if you have commercials. But if you're, you know, in this day and age, most people stream things, and you, you know, most people think things for free uh, with no commercials, not for free, but with no commercials, then you're not really getting any information back. You're not getting a whole lot of it. Um, so, um. Knowledge is good to have and not being aware of these things, you know, we not not being able to be aware. I'll put it like that. We don't get the opportunity because, like you said, in a lot of ways, we don't. It's not talked about often. And on the flip of it, it's, it falls in that, you know, healthcare black hole where a lot of that a lot of people avoid because of the cost. Right. So speaking of the vaccination and like kind of what your scheduling was, I just added in a link um, that says CDC adult vaccination schedule PDF. Um, I actually have printed this out at least two times for myself, if not three, um, because I went over at work. I also had a copy at home uh, because I realized like I don't know where I stand. And so I needed to look at um, I think it's page two of, of it where it basically breaks down in uh, groups of age what it is that um, you should have. Uh, available to you, you know, what you need, that kind of stuff. And the best thing is always check with, you know, your um, primary care physician staff, you know, that you're uh, well acquainted with, you know, or has um, information on this. You could also contact your local health department and um, ask to speak to the immunization uh, staff for any questions that you may have, and they can help walk you through some things. Agreed. And um, what was I going to say? It never hurts to know. I always will say that, like, uh, as you know, we're talking about, you know, this meningitis thing. And one of the reasons that it's becoming a concern is because it is, while it is not considered, quote unquote, a sexually transmitted infection, it is becoming prevalent among men. You said men who have sex with men. Right. Um, so if you are sexually active, um, then by all means, take some extra precautions because you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your partners. Right. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about in this next, um, the second of the two diseases, which has much more information is going to, in a way overlap to men, the meningococcal disease, um, only in that there's going to be some, some things about transmission ish, like, um, and that kind of stuff, uh, to keep in mind basically. But, um, the other one that's like now starting to hit the news, um, and you may have already seen alerts or heard people talk about it or uh, whatever, is monkeypox. Mm-hmm. Um, so some history uh, uh, about monkeypox and the naming. It was first discovered in 1958. Um, two outbreaks of a pox-like disease occurred in colonies of monkeys that were being kept for research. Hence, it got that name because that's its origin. Um, the source of the disease currently remains unknown. Um, African rodents and non-human primates may harbor the virus and therefore infect people. In 1970, that was the first recorded case of human uh, case of monkeypox that we have. uh, So it was 12 years from when it was discovered until it actually became uh, the first human case for infection. Mm. Prior to this year in 2022, nearly all the monkeypox cases um, in people – uh, outside of Africa specifically were linked to either international travel or through imported animals, meaning they became infected via an animal that was imported um, okay. that was already infected that they didn't know about. So um, there has been some recent discussion about whether or not this particular disease should have a new name attributed to it. 
um, zoonotic diseases or infections typically have a reference to the animal that it comes from. In fact, I was just discussed at work about how, um, you know, there was swine flu, only we don't really call it swine flu anymore. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that's kind of the natural progression of like how we want to um, not really cause any stigma against the source of where it's discovered because that's not really fair. I mean, we, when we had COVID and at first, you know, was being discussed, there were some individuals that were, you know, naming the country of origin Mm -hmm. um, and they were, you know, always using that like phrasing and that caused problems because individuals, you know, then sometimes are bigoted or ignorant or hateful, you know, and they're blaming a culture, a group of people. And it's like, it's really not fair. Yeah. So I will not be surprised if because of what's going on with this outbreak that, you know, that's also another thing that comes about is that they figure out a way to um, make a, a name change, but time will tell. So that being said, um, this 2022 outbreak. Um, so the first part of this, I'm going to kind of talk about from the World Health Organization perspective. Um, most of the reported cases so far have been identified with sexual health or health services in primary or secondary healthcare facilities that um, have been mostly involved, but not exclusively, men who have sex with men. Again, going back to the earlier part of the podcast where we're a more educated population and we're more engaged in our personal health, we're also more likely to bring things to the attention of who we go to for care if something seems wrong or off. Um, And understandably, if we are aware of like symptoms, you know, with HIV infection, um, we may be thinking, I don't know if this is that, but I certainly would like to know because Uh if I have contracted um, and, you know, become a person now living with HIV, I would like to get started on a proper medical regimen to reduce the viral load, live a full, you know, uh, and satisfied life. So that being said... The actual number of cases, and this is true, honestly, of pretty much all infectious diseases, are underestimated. Now, Mm. I'm not saying this to scare people, but part of that is due because the early clinical recognition of monkeypox or, you know, really any infectious disease um, is difficult if you don't know what you're looking at or what complicates it more is the symptoms that are presented look like other things. Right. So, okay, a person has a fever. Well, you know, do you know how many things in the world cause fevers? Like the fever is the body's reaction to right. an infection. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so everything. Like, right, right, right. So <laughs> it, it's difficult if a patient comes to a clinician or to staff, you know, and is explaining things and they're not necessarily, you know, up on all the things that are going on right now. Because while yeah. we live in a highly technical world with so much resources available at our fingertips, quote unquote, via like technology, it also makes it that much more difficult to stay aware of what's going on. Right. So that's why I've really turned into a like you, everybody needs their own, be their own personal health advocate. Um, If you have a question, if you think something's not right or whatever, you need to bring it to their attention. You need to have a discussion with somebody. Right. And like, just think of like, if you've ever watched, if you ever watched house, like, I don't know if you did, um, but Mm -hmm. I did like, especially in the beginning, the big thing for House always was like something's going on and they spent the episode, remainder of the episode, trying to figure out what it actually was. And it's right. never just, you know, because this is, again, this was also a medical drama. Um, it's never just something simple. It's never just like a cold. It's never just this or that. It always becomes something odd or off or different or unknown or rare. But that's what they were going for for the sake of the show. Right. But as you know, if you've ever watched it, you know what they go through. They do testing after test after test after test after test, narrowing things down, looking at the symptoms, trying to decide what is actually wrong. Because as you said, Gary, these symptoms could be this. It could also be this. It could also be this. You know, there are many things that it could potentially be. And the only way to rule things out sometimes is either through testing or through history, like talking with the person and finding out what was going on and maybe learning from there um, are just, you know, it sounds bad, but sometimes it's kind of guessing in a ways. Um, but to add to that, I will say this, 
um, and I will advocate this as much as possible, always be honest and forthcoming with your medical professionals. I know it can be weird to have those uncomfortable conversations, but you should always tell them what you were doing, maybe 24, 48 hours before something happened. Are, and be as clear as you can and concise as you can with that information. Um, you know, for me, like when I found out about my diverticulitis, I had to be honest, like I was, when I was telling about it, you know, I had to admit I've been having trouble using the bathroom for a couple of days. It's mm -hmm. not a pleasant conversation I wanted to have, but it's something that needed to be discussed. Um, it helped them make the determination on what was going on, and they were able to find the um, uh, rupture. It was minor, but it was there was a small rupture in my intestines, and that's how they figured out what was going on. Yeah, and I think it's important, Damon, that you bring up, you know, that you you be honest and forthright with whoever you're having discussions with. Um, if whether and it doesn't matter if it's your primary care physician, if it's someone that's um, triaging your medical condition, nursing staff, um, if it's from, you know, the local state department of health and it's a person like my role called the disease um, investigation uh, specialist, you know, where they're attempting to. Uh, focus on a particular thing and they're asking you what we call the investigation um, case history. And some of those questions can be, you know, pretty personal, but it's for a reason. It's to determine possibilities of transmission history, um, you know, and, and establishing a timeline because that's really what you're trying to do is figure out when did things start? When, you know, how did this come about? And, um, and that therefore gives all of the staff the ability in some way to make the best decisions for you and your personal health um, outcomes. Right. So when I'm talking about the actual numbers being underestimated, part of it is because there's limited in uh, surveillance mechanisms, which means how do we determine what this, this thing is? And in many countries, um, this is kind of previously an unknown disease in a lot of healthcare systems. Um, monkeypox is considered something that specifically is mostly seen in the continent of Africa. It doesn't really come outside of the continent very much. And, um, we don't really expect to have cases of it. So if it's not on the radar, then you're not really looking for it. You're you're thinking about the more common things that these symptoms are presenting. Right. So that being said, the numbers can be lower than actual reality because the first initial cases, whatever that amount was, could have been never diagnosed. Like they may not have really ever been known to be, you know, fill in the blank disease or infection or condition. So that being said, as of July 8th, there's some statistics here from the CDC. Um, on a global scale, there's been uh, over 8,000 cases. The top four countries are the UK, followed by Germany, followed by Spain, and the US. Um, in comparison, the US is about half of Germany and the UK. Um, keep in mind that the UK or Germany or Spain, their country is equivalent to the size of almost one state mm -hmm. in the US. So geography scale is very important <laughs> to think about because they are concentrated, quote unquote, you know, um, when you think about the, the ratio, like the amount of their entire country population can be equivalent to a whole US state. Um, so while, yes, we're ranked fourth in the US, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, we're, uh, you know, less likely um, to have cases. That being said, as of July 8th, for here in the U.S., um, the top five areas, uh, either regional territories or states, are New York, followed by California, Illinois, Florida, and the District of Columbia. This is not necessarily a surprise, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Population density. So when it comes to infectious disease, when you have groups of people combined together in a, in a closer geography, you're most likely going to have more spread. So what's in New York, New York City, what's in California, LA, San Francisco, maybe San Diego, in Illinois, we have Chicago, in Florida, we have Fort Lauderdale, Miami, Orlando, Key West. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the District of Columbia, aka Washington, DC, the nation's capital. So when you think about that in terms of population centers, it's not any surprise in the work that I do that where you have cities, you have like more numbers, so to speak. 
when it comes to that stuff. All that being said, um, there's some links to those particular uh, bits of information we just went over, as well as some frequently asked questions about monkeypox. Um, and I wanted to get into, because so, this is the more hot button issue at the moment, um, and there's some important things to know about it. So I'm going to kind of get a little bit into the, not really the weeds, but I'm going to talk about some specifics. First of all, the spread of monkeypox. Um, it is uh, mostly a uh, contact infection. Um, respiratory is possible, but it's not like COVID. Um, you need to have prolonged face-to-face -face contact, or it most likely is intimate physical contact is what's going to take place for the infection. Um, pregnant persons can spread the virus from their fetus, um, from themselves to their fetus through the placenta. Uh, touching items such as clothing or linens that previously were touched by an infectious rash or bodily fluid um, can be infectious to other people. So... Mm -hmm. That's why monkeypox is different. It's not like COVID where it's in the air and you can just wear a mask and you'll be, you know, somewhat Fine. safe. Yeah. This is about coming into contact with surfaces um, that have been infected because of what that's been in touch with or, right. more importantly, the people. Right. Now, monkeypox is not considered a sexually transmitted infection or disease because it isn't considered something that we think of when we talk about being spread by sex. However, yeah. monkeypox could be spread by people being physically in contact with each other, which means oral, insertive sex, um, touching genitals, uh, or the anus of a person with monkeypox is a transmission method, um, hugging, massage, kissing, talking closely with a person who's infected with monkeypox, um, mm -hmm. touching the fabrics, um, shared surfaces, objects such as bedding, towels, sex toys, um, that were used by a person with monkeypox are all up for uh, potential. Anyone can get monkeypox if they have been in close contact with someone who has the virus. And then the question becomes, well, how do you know you have the virus? Well, <laughs> we'll kind of get into that. Um, so sex is not necessarily required for infection. It's more considered a delivery mechanism. Right. Um, caretaking for another person is is kind of why we talk a lot about the linens and the clothing, that kind of stuff. Um, so if you think about these things, if you've ever been in medical care, like you've been in a, in a hospital or you've had a procedure, in those settings, we might not think about it much, but typically the staff always has a mask on um, and they wear gloves. That's all protective precautionary procedures. It's called universal um, precaution. Like you're trying to prevent any exposure and like spread. That's really what mm -hmm. those things are mm -hmm. about. We just don't really do that outside of those settings too much. I mean, COVID has taught us a lot about respiratory um, awareness, hence masks right. in places, that kind of stuff. Uh, signs and symptoms when it comes to monkeypox. So typically it presents with a fever, a rash and swollen lymph nodes, um, then those could lead to a range of medical complications depending on your personal uh, health. Underlying immune deficiencies uh, may lead to worse outcomes. In other words, if you are immune compromised, um, not just HIV, you could have other conditions. You could have yeah. um, cancer. You could have, um, you know, a disease of some sort that. Uh... Go ahead. My, my mom has lupus as a okay. perfect example. So yeah. it's an autoimmune disease. It will, it, you know. She's potentially prone to infection, so there's that. Right. I'm like one of my best friends. One of their parents had Epstein Barr, um, uh -huh. you know, or Guillain Barre. I mean, like you know, there, there's different things that exist out there that could you know make someone more prone. So usually, this is considered a self-limited disease, and what that means is that it has a, a specific window. It's not a like lifetime occurring kind of situation. So uh, it's usually about a two to four week time frame from like kind of your exposure then you go through your infection and you have all these symptoms we're going to discuss in a moment and then it kind of resolves itself um which in a way is showing that the body can handle it mm -hmm. or at least to date i should preface <laughs> correctly how the immune system has a way to fight it it just takes time and the big thing is that you really kind of need to isolate so that you're not having uh, potential exposure to other people so when it comes to monkeypox, there's what's called an incubation period, which is the interval from the infection to when you start having symptoms. So 
Um, I come into a contact with a surface, an infectious um, surface, whether that's a person or a thing. Um, and then eventually, because it gets into my body, then I, it starts replicating and then I start having symptoms. That incubation period is anywhere from six to 13 days. So that's mm. roughly one to two weeks. And it can range up to five to 21 days. So it could be less than a week, but it could be up to three weeks. Mm. This is why it's pretty important to know these things because when you do these things with disease investigation, like I've done, you're asking people to recall things from a while ago mm -hmm. where COVID right now, we talk a lot about like the last three days, maybe four or five days at most. This is different. This is a lot more like we discuss um, with some STIs about like, what have you done for the past month? Um, right. And I'll be honest, not everyone has the best of memory <laughs> on no. everything they've done. Uh -uh. I would be out of place without like I have a calendar that I keep on my I have I have to have a calendar. Right. And while it's not always perfect, if it if I can pinpoint some things, you know, if you ask me, what was I doing two weeks ago? I can look at my calendar and maybe give you an idea like, oh, a couple of weeks ago was, um, it was a Sunday, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, I don't recall doing anything that day because it was the day after Pride and my body was tired. Um, <laughs> so right. I just probably stayed home and then did the show. Right. Because I do see that the uh, what going on for June was on my calendar. Right. Mm -hmm. So... After the incubation period, um, you end up with what's kind of called the invasion period. Um, it usually lasts zero to five days, um, and it's characterized by this. This is the symptoms. So now we've moved from incubation to actually having symptoms. Fever, intense headache, swelling in the lymph nodes. The lymph nodes are a part of like your immune system, the way your body fights infection. You have them all over your body. But mm -hmm. the main ones we typically know about are uh, on either side of our throat, mm -hmm. um, in our armpits. Right. Uh, and in our groin, but mm -hmm. they literally are kind of all over the body. So if you think about like, sometimes you end up with these strange, like kind of, um, bumps. And I don't mean like a pimple bump, like this strange kind of like, I don't know if you want to call it a nodule or whatever, like kind of seems tender or swollen. Right. Um, that's probably a lymph node that is actually fighting an infection. So it's kind of localized, um, in that particular area. And so what we're talking about here is that, your lymph nodes swell up because of the infection that's ongoing and the body's trying to fight what the infection is, but that usually has you know pain that comes with it. Um, you may also have back pain, muscle aches, um, and an intense lack of energy. You may not have all of these things. You may only have one or some. Um, your right. symptoms may be very mild, which is why it's disconcerting about knowing whether or not it is monkeypox because if you kind of have like a mild headache and you're just kind of tired, like mm -hmm. you're not really sure. And part of this is because every person's body reacts differently to medical things. Right. And the right. downside of this kind of crap, crap, <laughs> crap being bacteria and viruses is they're evolutionarily geared to make more. And the way they're successful with that is to not be detectable, like to not cause mm -hmm, mm -hmm. problems to, you know, which allows them to replicate more. But it's, I won't get into the science of it really. The kind of whole philosophy is the more infectious something can be, it won't necessarily be more problematic mm -hmm. because there's like a payoff. Like if right. whatever the infection is kills the host, guess what it can't do? Can't, can't replicate. Right. Can't, can't spread. So anyways, yeah. it's kind of a sidebar. Yeah. Okay. Um, so after incubation and the invasion period, now we have uh, kind of references the skin eruption period. And this is usually one to three days um, of the appearance of fever. So it could be within a day of the fever or up to three days from when your fever starts. It could be while your fever is going or maybe your fever has subsided. Uh -huh. um, a rash tends to be concentrated on the face or the extremities um, rather than on the trunk. The trunk being your core, like between your hips and your shoulders. Um, it can affect the face. So a lot of this um, you'll see on our blog I've listed, 95% of the cases uh, affect the face. Palms and hands and soles of the feet are 75% of the time. Um, can also affect your um, mucous membranes, specifically oral in 70% of cases, your genitalia. 
um, 30% of the time. The front of the eyes are the lines inside your eyelids um, 20% of the time, as well as the cornea. In other words, it can go a lot of places. <laughs> mm. <laughs> David's like, no, ma'am. <laughs> um, I do not like that. Oh, right. Uh, the rash typically evolves sequentially um, for the following. So you end up with what are called lesions. Um, so the first phase has like what's called a flat base um, to what's called a papule, which is a slightly raised firm lesion. Um, I'm going to warn you now, if anybody has already done it, my apologies, I should have said this earlier. If you go looking on the internet at what the physical like signs and symptoms of monkeypox are, you're probably going to see what this rash looks like and then the stuff I'm describing. Just be aware to not do that. Maybe um, kind of gross. gross. <laughs> well, I don't know if I would necessarily say it's gross. However, it, baby, the internet is the Wild West. Like, you could pretty much find anything on there. So if you're not ready to look at certain things of a medical condition, you know, just be aware. Because some of this stuff might gross people out. Um, then you end up with what's called a vesicle, which is a lesion filled with clear fluid. And then a pustule, which is a lesion filled with a yellowish fluid. Um, and then eventually it uh, crusts and dries up, meaning there's no more fluid. And then the scab, the crust of that particular lesion falls off. So think of it like a pimple or like a scab with a wound. Um, you end up with this like change in the skin surface and then it um, goes through a couple different stages. One of the earlier ones has a clear fluid um, and then a yellowish fluid and then eventually you end up with this crust or this scab for the lesion and then it comes off. Mm. When the, the crust or the, the scab comes off and it is he like um, healed skin beneath, that is when you are considered no longer um, in disease or infectious. Right. So it's kind of important to know like about this as a generality um, because – the lesions can vary from just a few to several thousand. Right. Um, and yeah. part of that is, is several factors. Um, it's about exposure. It's also about you probably spreading on yourself. Mm -hmm. So think of it like chicken pox yeah. or measles, like, um, or even like a rash. Like sometimes, you know, the, the body's reaction to infection is annoying. And then you, you know, want to scratch or itch, mm -hmm. um, you know, or massage or other ways, you know. And the issue is, is that you can actually be spreading more of whatever the uh, infection uh, substance is, in this case, the um, virus. So that's all stuff to kind of be aware of. Now, the thing about monkeypox is, um, the very earliest stages, some people might misconstrue as like pimples mm -hmm. or zits um, and not really quite know what it is. There is a difference, but, you know, how are you really going to know unless it's something that you're uh, kind of aware of? Right. Um, when I was speaking about the lesions and the numbers, if a lot of them are densely connected or side by side, then it's kind of considered a severe case. And then. Um, a larger section of your skin um, could come off collectively together because basically the lesions have joined, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, right. That's why I was like, just be aware. Google image search or whatever may not be your yeah. friend. With yeah. I, I just did a quick just. Yeah. Um. Uh -huh. Don't Google that. And of course, what do you do? You I mean, I, 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 what I, I knowledge is power. So, <laughs> right. just saying, right. uh, I, I have you know, justification. I yeah, I wanted to look, and I looked. Uh, I, I'm not sorry I looked, right? But I looked. <laughs> well, no, and and, and you the didn't thing enjoy is, what I, you found, but you looked. Right. Well, I mean, trust me. I've now with the job that I've had, I looked at a PowerPoint recently about sexually transmitted infections and saw genitalia in infection. Ooh. Let me just tell you, that is not something that I enjoy. You wanted, you wanted to see, necessarily wanted to see, but you kind of had to see. Right, 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 right. right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so um, this uh, so this reminds me a lot of like cold sores. It's not really, but, you know, in a sense mm. where it's, it shows up, it's there. You can't really do anything like you can. You can take some things to kind of help it. But like, 
you basically have to let it ride its course. Mm. Um, Very fair. You can put, you know, medications to kind of help soothe it um, and heal it. You know, Abriva kind of indicates that it, it does heal, and I can agree with that. Um, but I've had to deal. I've had. I've. I have cold sores. I get them like every once in a while. Um, they are not fun, um, especially when like they show up at the most in- inopportune times. Um, but you just kind of have to let it happen, right? And then take care of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> take care of it, and then you know you you isolate as much as you can. But it is also on your mouth, so you know. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about treatment and vaccination for monkeypox. Uh, there are no treatments specifically for monkeypox virus infections. There is not a, a medicine that you can take to counteract it um, mm-hmm. once you have an infection that has started um, at this point, And there is not a way to treat it beyond the symptoms, which are not monkeypox itself, but the body's reaction. So, like, you can take an anti-inflammatory if you have, like, a fever to try to reduce your fever, you know, like an NSAID or something along those lines. Um, But, you know, like, um, so if you end up with an infection and you have symptoms, let your healthcare staffing know because they may be able to uh, suggest over-the-counter or give you prescriptions for things to help with whatever symptoms you're having. Like, if you have a rash and it's very itchy, they may be able to give you something, you know, some type of like response uh, antihistamine concept, you know, so that way you can not feel like, you know, you're going through hell because your body's like super itchy or on fire or whatever right. the, the symptom may be, the sensation. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about smallpox a little bit. The reason is, is that uh, the smallpox vaccination could potentially prevent monkeypox. Mm. But there's some things to know. Uh, Although vaccination against smallpox was protective in the past, it's important to know that today persons younger than 40 to 50 years of age, depending on the country, may be more susceptible to monkeypox um, because smallpox vaccination campaigns were pretty much ended after eradication of the disease. Now, eradication is kind of misleading because obviously, right. you know, when we're talking about monkeypox, but smallpox is considered related, but it's not quite the same thing. So you might think of them as like cousins at the family reunion. Um, <laughs> and so of it, yeah. the the thing that's happening is now we're trying to figure out, like, what are our next steps? What do we do in terms of vaccination? Um, the CDC does not recommend widespread vaccination against monkeypox at this time because there's several factors we just don't know. Um, and this is probably going to agitate people because they feel like, how do you not know these things? Well, maybe the world is large and there's a lot of things that it's very complex right. to stay on top of everything. And right. as much as we try to predict disease and infection and behavior, you can't always, you know, get everything accurate. Um, that said, for the U.S., our government does have two stockpiles of uh, vaccine, the JYNNEOS, the Genios, and the ACAM2000 or the ACAM2000 that can prevent monkeypox in people who have been exposed to the virus. Um, The reason why it's phrased that way is because we just don't have enough to prophylactically or preventively vaccinate people. Got it. So if someone's exposed, this is a treatment method, but all you're really doing is trying to head it off as early as possible to prevent um, a severe result. Got it. Um, It's not necessarily that if you get the vaccine after exposure, it will 100% prevent an exposure, you know, an infection, but it also will not. um, What it would do is give you a chance of less uh, symptomology, so to speak, um, in that case. So don't go to your local Walgreens to go searching for a small uh, monkeypox vaccine. Right. Um, and asking them about this at this time. That right. being said, 
do watch for changes in the vaccine availability. Um, there is a presumption that at-risk populations, such as men who have sex with men, are going to be encouraged to get what's called prophylactic vaccination. In other words, go get vaccinated as a preventative. But that won't happen until there's a supply chain made available. Um, and I'll talk right. about that a little bit more here in a moment. So yeah. two things uh, that we kind of discussed today is diseases. The takeaways are... Knowledge and awareness are the prevention tools of fear. Knowledge is power. Right. In other words, don't be scared and freaked out. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just going to say this with this job that I have now, there was, we make it, we make a joke every once in a while. We're like, if people really knew that having any human interaction with other people, what it could lead to people would just not do anything. Like they wouldn't touch another person. They wouldn't talk to another person. Like the chastity devices all around. Like, (laughs) no, no, they would just just hold up. Like they would just, they would just never go anywhere. Never talk to anybody. Never do anything. Never touch anything. Like, yeah. Nope. And that's, that's not a realistic way. Yeah. 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 So it's not, but I, I, yeah, sorry. I'm just, I'm just gonna, I will remember, because, you know, we recently talked about things like family life and all of that stuff. And I remember being in middle school, and I think it was the sixth grade one. And they're talking, they did talk about the STDs, the STDs is what it was at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, eyes wide, like, and this is one, this is another one, this is the other thing. And you can get all of these, and you can possibly have them all at the same time. I was just, like, wide eyed, scared right. as shit. Like, right. nope. Ain't, I didn't say I was never having sex because I was, um, <laughs> but right. it was very much that like fear of because I didn't know, right? Yeah, no, and that makes sense. So, uh, to, here's an important piece: while these diseases can be life changing and possibly lead to death if they're not treated you know, not taken care of because everybody's got a different kind of body, different immune system. We do have tools that limit infections and community spread. Hence, knowledge, awareness, um, staying up on these kind of things, letting folks know what their options are. Now, if you are unsure about any symptoms that you're experiencing, absolutely talk with a healthcare professional, preferably one that is familiar with these diseases. Now, the reason why I say that is Smallpox, monkeypox, meningococcal—that one's a little bit maybe more on the on the awareness. I, I expect when I go to talk to my PCP, they might have some familiarity. That's kind of why I picked them. But you know, the vast majority of like family practice, general physician, you know, kind of individuals, this may not be on their you know their brain front because it's just not something that they're you know um, thinking about. If the healthcare system that they work with, that they're affiliated with is, you know, being proactive and sending out alerts and notifications, they will do the best that they can. But, you know, um, health alerts come out all the time about a gazillion different things, and it can be very challenging to stay on top of stuff. Right. So that being said, um, when you talk to healthcare professionals, um, you could talk to staff at what's called a federally qualified health center or FQHC. Um, These can typically be clinics. Um, sexual health clinics in your immediate regional area, they may have a, not a, a area of expertise, so to speak, but they might have more awareness um, because of the communities that are potentially going to be um, affected. Uh, obviously, your personal physician or a reputable LGBTQIA health practitioner Um those are kind of like the unicorns in the medical industry, people who are aware of our community broadly and the different issues that we face um, and what we try to take care of now more than ever. Like when I was younger, half my age, I never imagined that I would be listening to other people talking about like, hey, does anybody know like, you know, uh, a bear that's a physician, you know, um, non-specialty that has a clinic with office hours and is taking patients because – um, while some people might be like, oh, that sounds kind of pervy, the reality is someone might be like, well, I'd really like to talk to somebody who can relate, like mm-hmm. who understands what my life is like, a certain aspect mm-hmm. of it, and can help me make the best decisions for my health. So um, right. I never – yeah, I just didn't imagine that I would have that. But as I've gotten older, that's been part of the conversation. Um, and it came up again recently. Someone was discussing with me. They were like, do you know – 
any, you know, practitioners locally? And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting because um, there's not necessarily folks that are known to be out. And the reason why I say it that way is because like technically the, the, or the sexual behavior activities of your healthcare staff is really none of your damn business. Fact. Wait, I have one of these. <laughs> However, um, if they are open about that, that might give you some comfort in the care that you get from them. So, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a mixed bag, um, whether or not most likely you're going to find out about health practitioners who have open policies, um, make it known. They may advertise to the community specifically for um, their health. You may have local health care um, systems that were built from the ground up specifically for our community that's happening in more densely populated areas. Um, so keep those things in mind. Now, for these two particular diseases, here's our takeaways. For meningococcal disease, obviously talk with your healthcare provider about getting the MEN ACWY vaccine, especially if your travel plans include Florida. Um, I think you should just most likely get it no matter where you're going to travel because – to, to talk about Florida as a specific geographic area is fine. However, that is not explicit. Like, people travel in and out of Florida all the damn time. Like, you know right. what I mean? So it's like, while there was an outbreak, has been an outbreak in that state, it does not mean that it's staying in that state. Um, we just really haven't seen any other cases at the moment that are drawing the attention in other areas. Um, yeah. And then also, provide your healthcare uh, staff providers with information and links uh, and be your own healthcare advocate. Um, this is the biggest thing that I think is important that people should know is that you need to be the one that knows your body, knows what's going on and makes requests of things. Um, I've done it. If you don't care for who your uh, person is, get another person. I did right. it with my primary care physician. They're not a bad individual. I just didn't care for their style of care, their personality um, when it came to some things and I found a new one. Yeah. So like, as a perfect example was my health, like going to get the meningitis vaccine. Now, this wasn't my personal doctor. This was a just a pharmacist at the at the area. I wasn't trying to be all specific about what I'm doing, right? But um, I did. He asked, like, so you know, why are you why you know? He asked why I was coming in. And I kind of mentioned, like, oh, I'm going to an event in Florida, and they advised that um, uh, to kind of keep it general. I said I'm going mm -hmm. to an event in Florida, and they advised since I'm going to this event in Florida to get the meningitis vaccine because there is an outbreak there. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Now he asked a couple of questions and I was kind of like, um, you ain't, you're, you're not my PCP. I don't need right. to tell you everything. Um, <laughs> right. Right. So, but you know, I got gener enough general, a, a general enough answer that he stopped asking questions. Right. And, and that's an excellent example, Damon. Like you're – thank you for sharing that because you don't have to spill all the beans. Like you don't have to tell people all your business um, that don't need to know it. But hopefully you do have confidence in, in some medical staff, hopefully your, your mm -hmm. primary care uh, provider, yeah. to have a, a more open conversation with them as right. opposed to just like a pharmacy technician. Right. In this example that you gave, you know, to discuss yeah. whatever this thing is. But I, I think you handled it really well to say – I'm going to a, an event. They've made this known that there is, you know, potential with an outbreak, you know, and it would be, you know, precautionary to do this and just kind of leave it at that. Um, and honestly, if you're talking with anybody and they give you, you know, kind of the heebie-jeebies, you know, you don't feel comfortable with it, then don't continue, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and just be like, you know what, I'm going to have this discussion with somebody else or whatever, which yeah. is kind of what happened with me. Like, I'll be honest, I tried talking to my former physician about PrEP. And mm -hmm. they, I got a completely blank face. They didn't know what I was talking about. So I sent them a whole series of links and articles through their portal, uh, email type, you know, situation. Mm -hmm. Never heard back. And I was like, okay, like, I get that you're busy. You've got a clinical practice, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. And I'm not like, and most of the clients are a little older. So maybe I'm not necessarily your demographic, but, but I just, I was like, no, like, this isn't working not, with me. Yeah. So I, have, um... I went to somebody new 
And what's ironic is I'm getting prepped through a different provider, but my my primary care provider, I mentioned it in the intake because they kind of said, you know, why were you deciding to come here? And I'm like, well, I'm changing total healthcare systems, different insurance. And I wanted to go to somebody that I felt would understand some things. And specifically, one of my things was about prep. And they were like, oh, yeah, OK, no big deal. Right. And I was like, Sweet. nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Um, yeah, I found my personal, my current personal care physician through um, our um, HIV AIDS um Mm-hmm. Um, Caracol, like their area. So it was, a, and it became because of prep. Um, I won't go into the story, but. No, and that's because, an excellent example yeah. of how like a specialist kind of clinic, so to speak, can mm-hmm. give you referrals to other entities so that you can get what it is that you're looking for. Yeah. Like I'll probably mention during, because I have a, an appointment later this month. Um, I'll probably, I actually asked like on the forum at Walgreens about like, do you want to share this information with your doctor? Mm-hmm. And they, I gave them my doctor's information because I did, because right. I will be having a conversation with them because there's a specific reason why I'm getting this. And right. given our history, the PCP, with the, my PCP, it makes sense for them to know right. this. And that is one of the things that I think people do not understand or necessarily know very well about the U S medical industry is, well, yes, we do have HIPAA, which is about privacy and protection of your your personal information. Um, not necessarily is your information shared because we don't have universal health coverage with one database of everything. Um, you can have up to five different healthcare persons in different clinics, different practices, different whatevers, and even though maybe they all take the same insurance, there is no guarantee that anything is cross-pollinated and shared data-wise mm-hmm. amongst them. And so, like, you could go to, like, the sexual health, like, sexual health clinic and be getting, you know, treatment or testing there, and, like, your primary care physician knows nothing about that. Your cardiologist knows nothing about that. You know, um, yeah. you know, your mental health behavior specialist knows nothing about that. Like, so it's really your choice how you want to share that. And while that is okay and it's more empowering for you, it also puts the requirement on you to make sure that you share to who you want to know things. Right. So that's a good example. I mean, yeah. I got referred out. So just, again – for like my sleep apnea, I got referred out to um, try how here in, in in the city, and I went in to get the appointment, and they had all the information, but they had all the information from when I treated like five six years ago with a totally different doctor, mm. and it was kind of like, no, that's not my personal physician anymore. No, I don't treat there anymore. I haven't treated there in years. Here's my current doctor. <laughs> Here's where they are. I need them to know. And, right. and they didn't, by the way, um, just kind of putting that out there. They didn't send the information because I got a call later from my personal doctors setting up the appointment. And she had no idea that I had already had the appointment and was like waiting for my machine. Yeah. This this kind of goes back to the personal advocacy issue, like you know, making making your healthcare a priority and taking charge of some things. Um, it might feel like you know that you're being annoying or very needy and that kind of stuff, but it may be required that you hold people accountable and keep right. them in, in the know. Um, so as we're wrapping up here, so the takeaways: monkeypox, the the m- more recent bigger one we were discussing. Um, more than ever. I highly suggest that you know your partners and their sexual their history and awareness. Now, that being said, I am well aware and acquainted and educated that this is not normal. This is not a typical practice that a lot of um, persons who are sexually active do, especially in a hookup culture concept, you know. Um, you're going to parks, you're going to uh, glory holes, you're going to bookstores, you're going to bathhouses. And anonymity is kind of the name of the game. The concept is like to have an orgasm, receive orgasms, swap some DNA, whatever that is, right? Have some physical activity, have a good time, get in a hormone endorphin rush and take off and not really like, you know, do a whole uh, history with another person. Right. So just 
keep those things in mind. I'm not saying don't do those things because I'm not foolish and this isn't the 80s and I'm not the CDC trying to shut down bathhouses. <laughs> but I would like you to know you should kind of have some awareness um, because it will make things that much more difficult if you come into contact, have an exposure, are infected, and you really can't provide information to people like what I do in my job because you don't really have information. Well, right. I met this person on Scruffy's or I met them on this app and like, I don't know their name and this and that. And it's <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> but um, there are ways to kind of figure out how to go back and, and contact people if you can. Um, mm -hmm. So just keep those things in mind. Now, while a preventative vaccine is not being offered universally for monkeypox, be aware of the options as they occur. Here's right. why. Some regional areas with higher cases have been offering vaccination events. Pretty much every time they did a vaccine event, the response overwhelms the available supply. Um, there's an article here that is going to be included. Uh, this happens to be from the New York Times. Um, and you should, if you don't frequent the New York Times very often, you should be able to get a couple of articles a month for free to review. This one is about how the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is planning to make 1.6 million doses available by the end of 2022 for these vaccines we talked about earlier um, as a preventative for monkeypox. Um, and, you know, there as each week goes by, like more, more testing labs are coming on, you know, the mm -hmm. U.S. Um, DHHS, as we call it uh, for short, is trying to get vaccinations out there, all that kind of stuff. You know, people are a little concerned that it's too little too late. Um, mm. But you know what? There's always going to be criticism. At least they're making an effort to do something. Um, keep in mind the 1.6 million doses. Uh, what you kind of need to know is in this case, um, unless things have changed, uh, these are not one and done um vaccination shots and mm. the reason why i say that is because um you may have a, a two shot or two dose regimen and the reason why that's important is because then when you take the 1.6 million and divide it by two that takes it down to 800,000, and that's still a pretty really impressive number um but just kind of keep in mind that when these things come available kind of like covid um, you may have not just one you know, appointment, you may have a, a couple, depending mm. on what the, the circumstances are. So um, I'll pass more information on as it becomes available. Um, I'm not going to cover this topic every single week here with the podcast. I'll probably try to keep it um, as needed um, so people you know, kind of know about stuff. I might keep it more to the what's going on uh, episodes. Basically, prevention is key in public health to help limit the spread of infection and disease. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. That's really what my job is about is like educating folks, making things available uh, to the public so that they know that. And this is sort of an, an extension of that. Um, like we kind of said at the beginning, we're not medical professionals in terms of like giving you uh, diagnosis and those kind of things. A lot of this stuff um, that I have talked about and all that's going to be written on the blog is literally coming from I don't even know. There's probably like 15, 20 links um, of different sources that all of this was taken right out of. So read it, go through it um, as you can, make yourself aware. Um, and don't just take you know my word for it. Talk to other folks, get other information um, that's available. I was listening to another podcast recently where they interviewed a person who had become infected with monkeypox who was advocating um, as a person living with, so to speak, uh, intentionally to push back against any potential stigma. Um, and I mm. got what they were talking about because they were, you know, they wanted people to understand like, you know, what the experience is like. And more importantly, you know, that this is not, especially in terms of monkeypox, it's not a life debilitating condition. At least it's not considered that. Mm. That being said, you still need to, you know, have some awareness uh, and those kind of things um, to talk to other folks. So that's really what this this whole episode is about is these are not technically considered STIs. However, sexual activity can be a transmission method. Mm -hmm. um, in one of them, there's absolutely a vaccine that's available that you can go. Um, Damon's already done it. 
uh, like he was giving as an example in this episode that you can go uh, get vaccinated in advance. Um, the other one, we're waiting to get more information available and then, uh, you know, folks will be kind of going over that. So yeah. don't be surprised if you see things come out, especially in the news. Um, I think it's mostly going to be more in the apps and in that kind of stuff, uh, possibly social media that comes about. But that's mm -hmm. really what um, a bunch of this stuff is about. I kind of hope that I don't have to do a lot of these. Um, <laughs> But who yeah. knows? You know, we may have more uh, discussions in the time to come. Um, and if you are somebody who is in the bear community that works in the medical field, um, you work in a, in a sexual health clinic uh, as a practitioner and are interested in coming on and being a guest, we would love to have you um, join us. It's an area that we don't necessarily have someone to call upon to answer questions. Um, so... You know, or if you know of somebody that might be interested or has done this kind of stuff, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to, to have a conversation with them and have them come on as well. Maybe instead of a hostful news update, it'll be a health news update. That could be. Maybe. Who knows? And with that, I'm guessing that's the end, question mark. Yes. Uh, I'm presuming I both of you don't have any other questions. Mm -hmm. I think you no. pretty much c covered everything top to bottom that we have. Well, which was everything you had. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and, and I guess I didn't really d cover this, but let's say that you are in the moment with somebody and you kind of discover something, especially in terms of what we were describing with monkeypox. Uh, step one, don't freak out. <laughs> like, that's the most important thing. True. Because you're going to alarm your partner, the person that you're with as well. Um, but uh, probably have a conversation with them, you know, mm -hmm. make them uh, aware. And the reality is you don't quite know specifically, depending on the circumstances, what it is that you're, you're looking at. Um, but that kind of goes back to my earlier point about like kind of know um, their history. More importantly, their awareness. Like, are they in the know that something's going on and, mm -hmm. you know, to to be aware of of things you know and i i will admit it it's a it's a difficult position i'm in because i'm a public health worker who is kind of working in hiv prevention i know a lot of this stuff and then i see people talking about like oh i can't wait to like go to the bathhouse and get you know railed and blah 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 and there's a part of me that's like Ooh. you go like you, you <laughs> sexually positive you know and yeah. do that thing and have a good time and and, and at the same time, and most of these people, I don't really know them that well. So I don't want to step in and be, you know, like the annoying uh, parent and be like, now make sure you use protection. Um, you know, ask those questions. <laughs> better use a condom or whatever, you know, like <laughs> that's not really my role. And I don't want to step into that. And at the same time, I'm kind of like, I hope, you know, like to be cautious, just to be. Um, aware and one of the downsides as we were discussing with monkeypox is like we do have a bit of a window between exposure and like potential infection showing up and, and that kind of stuff and that that's the more uh, difficult part yeah. of this is that someone could be um, non-symptom and questionably infectious Right. Um, and the reason why I say questionable is because it's not really that well known. And that is one of the concerns cur currently is the reason why monkeypox is on the rise is because it has figured out a way to not be on the radar, meaning it's not really giving you these typical symptoms. And that, like, you know, kind of causes the strange domino effect of, you know, more spread because people aren't necessarily, you know, showing the usual signs. So. But I'm also not wanting to fear monger. I don't want people to be like, oh, my God, I can never have sex again. Like, that's not it either. You know? What you're trying to do um, is is tamp down people's blood, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Correct. There we are. That's F -U -D, a good final word, right? Yeah. But good. I have to think for a second. I'm sorry. I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is FUD? Um... Fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Yes, I, 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 I'm aware now. It 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 just dots connected. Very anyway, Takes move on. on. Move on. But if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and there's several ways to do that, right, Jeff? Yeah, you can do that over on our blog at cubsoutlaw.com. You can shoot us an email at cubsoutlaw at gmail.com, leave us voicemail, 
at 361 COL Talk. That's 361 265 8255. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at Cubs Out Loud in the appropriate place of the URL. You can also join our entourage chat and chat with us directly by going to tinyurl.com slash telegram dash col. If you want to know when we're recording these shows, you can follow us on our Google Calendar at tinyurl.com slash calendar dash co. What the heck are you doing, Damon? I am waiting for you to get to Zazzle. Oh. Speaking of which, if you like Kutramon, such as the comes out on mug, is that a hand towel? Yes. <laughs> or one of our new Pride Consensus My Four Play shirts. You can't see the white stripe because it's a white shirt, but it's there. Uh, or uh, various other Kutramon, you can do that at Zazzle, Zazzle.com slash comes out loud. You can also uh, find some of those designs were designed by Smashy, but you can find more of his work at, t- at tpublic.com slash user slash Smashy the Bear. You can also become a patron to us at patreon.com slash Cubs Out Loud, or if you just want to send us a donation, you can do that at paypal.me slash Cubs Out Loud. You can subscribe to us and rate us and review us on, on Apple Podcasts and Google Play, Amazon Audible. Bring your review means that the more people that, that do that means that more people that see the show and they be able another way of spreading all this great information uh you can also uh find me anywhere on the internet as box step box puppy box cub box something or other and wind gem w-y-n-d-g-e-m on twitch where i run a dungeon and dragons campaign uh, for bears and dragons where a bunch of us nerdy ass bears play around and play dungeons and dragons Demon. If you wish to get in touch with me, you can find me as Theater Cub 79 on most bear related sites are on Facebook. That's T H E A T R E C U B 79. Or you can find me as Pup underscore Umbra on Twitter. The Twitter is definitely not safe for work. If you would like to get in touch with me, you can pretty much find me anywhere online as GareBear73. Um, when it comes to Twitter, I have uh, GareBear73XXX. Um, I have not created one to be available for questions when it comes to public health things. Uh, but maybe I'll do that someday. Wait and see. Hmm. M- might come in handy for, for your for your job. Who knows? We'll see. And with that, take it on, everybody. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Have a good one, y'all. <laughs>